Hi, good evening, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. So today is our ninth section of his, uh, history of Greco-Roman philosophy. And last week we talked about pre-Socratic philosophy on the um, Asia Minor, which is so-called the uh, Malaysian school or Ionian school. So today we are going to move to the other side of uh, map, which is on the Southern Italy. And I will call it the Ideatic school, but they may not be the proper name, but you know, anyway, uh, to the end of today's uh, meetup, you probably can give me some suggestion what would be the good name for this school. And the next week, we are going to move on to uh, 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 Democritus and uh, uh, Epicurus, okay, which is on the uh, Greek side. Okay, so the same time with uh, Plato and Aristotle. So that's the schedule. And the, so here on this philosophy, on the map, that's all the philosopher I try to cover. And the, the blue one is the one we already covered. Okay, so we already cover all these philosophers. And the, the, the red one is the one we are going to uh, cover today. And the, the black one is the we are going to cover in the future. So I hope you can uh, go through all these philosophers and then get the idea uh, what's the Western tradition of uh, philosophers. Okay. So basically, uh, last week we deal with the philosopher on this area. And the Today, we are going to deal with the philosopher in this area, okay? So next week, we are going to deal with the philosopher Greek. Okay. So uh, you, if you were here last week, then you were, you probably you can tell the significant difference between the philosophers or philosophies in this side and the philosophy this side, okay? So, Today, let's go over. And the basics of what we are going to do is we, are, we already covered the uh, Platonic dialogue and uh, Aristotle's writing. And then last week, we talked about the uh, pre Socratic philosophers. They don't have writing, they don't have books like Plato and Aristotle. Only thing we have is a fragment. So a lot of things we have relied on the second uh, hand, uh, second sources, and then we have, and a lot of things are just fragment. So we have to rely on other writing to figure out. So in this case, that means we don't have, um, we don't have the complete book to read. But just like uh, we will, I will show some of text and that we can read together. And if you have a question or you have something you feel in, you, you, you feel interested, then maybe you can, uh, we can bring up to discuss. So that's the philosopher I kind of lay out. Last week we talked about in this area, which is Ionian school. And this week we are going to talk about philosophy for this area. And the next week, we are going to deal with uh, these three philosophers, okay? uh, Lucifer's, uh, Democritus, and Epicurus. So that's we are going, and then you will see today, we, I try to complete, conclude the pre-Socratic philosophy. Basically, I will quickly overview on last week on the uh, Malaysian school, and this area that will be the focus on today. And then we will, to this point, we finish the pre-Socratic philosophy. And then next week we can move on. So I think next week I will conclude the Greek philosophy. And then the week after I will move on to Roman philosophy. So that's the uh, schedule. So uh, before I move on, is there any question or any comment or anything you want to talk about? I will pause for a few minutes if you have 
anything to say. Okay, so uh, since everybody is fine, so. Uh, okay, so uh, let's move on. So, I think. Okay, last week we already deal with this. The very beginning of Western philosophy, we start from the Malaysian school or Malaysian philosophers. Basically, last week we talked about Sadis, uh, Anaximanders, and uh, Anaximanians. So these three philosophers, basically we call them Malaysian philosophers because they are on Libya, which in today's Turkey. Uh, there's one common thing they all talked about. They are in today's sense, they are scientists. So what they are talking about is they talk about Archie, okay, which means the starting point or the basic stuff. So they try to use something called Archie, the fundamentals are to explain everything. Instead of go through the mythology, they more on the material way. So sometimes people call them empiricism or call them the material moist. So for example, uh, Sadis try to say everything is water. So he want to use water, uh, water to explain everything. And uh, uh, the Anaximanders try to say everything is apparel. Apparel is something boundless, mist, you know, we don't know what's there. And the other menus can try to use fire or uh, air to explain everything. So that's a, mal mal a malicious school. And then after that comes with <coughs> Pythagoras. Pythagoras is also on the Asian side, but he, I think everyone knows who is Pythagoras in the, uh, uh, in the middle school <coughs> or primary school geometry. Uh, we all know the Pythagoras. Grand uh, rules, right? The a square plus b square equal to c square. <coughs> but it's pretty reasonable. If you think about this kind of uh, discovery, you will go in the way you will, it's a very ration, uh, rationality, very rational way, right? You can find out <coughs> any right triangle, you can find out the, the third side by knowing two sides. In a way, it's rational. But in a way, they also find out the irrational side because it's pretty easy to find out, to face this kind of situation. If it's a right triangle, it's one on one on the other side, and the other side must be square root two. And the square root two basically it has no way to use two integers to represent it. And then we all know the number 1.1421. So become a number which beyond ancient people to understand. So in this case, it kind of go to mystical because it's that kind of uh, uh, conflict between rational and irrational side. So that's a two side of conflict. So in this case, uh, Pythagorean, Turn out that he become a religious cult. So he moved, if we look at the map, he moved from Samos okay, and to Croton on this side. Okay. So to set up his religious group, and then uh, he's not just by himself, like he probably gathered a lot of people together. So we call them Pythagoreanism. Okay. So that's a Pythagorean become a group. And he probably, of course, we don't have enough uh, histor historical evidence to show what's the activity they are doing. And then I copy from the history of Western philosophy by Bertrand Russell. And then that's the, their rule they are doing. Okay, so I'm not sure how accurate of this one. Uh, we all know Bertrand Russell write the book and the he has his own opinion. So just for your reference. So it looks like it's a little bit mystical and a religious kind of group. So that's about Pythagoras. He's from, uh, we can call him a mathematician, geometrician, 
And then later on, he become a religious leader, okay, religious cult. So that's about the Pythagoras. So uh, a Malaysian school and then become a, a come with the Pythagoras, which struggle with rational and irrational. And later on, he moved uh, from the Asia Minor to uh, Southern Italy okay, to set up his group. So that's the history goes. So any, I will stop here for one second. If you have question, comment. Okay, so next I'm going to move on to the uh, so-called officer. Uh, I copy this one from Bertrand Russell's writing. I think his uh, comment is very interesting when he talked about uh, the uh, Southern Italian side and he talked about uh, morphism. Uh, morphism, uh, orphism. orphism is obvious and obvious is uh, in the Greek mythology, he went to the hell and to find his wife. Okay. So, so that's a little mystic. So I will read this one. The office were an aesthetic set. Why to them was only a simple, as the later in Christian and intoxication, they saw as enthusiasm of union with the God. So they believe themselves in this way to acquire mystic knowledge, not attainable by ordinary means. So uh, think about the uh, Pythagorean's idea, right? So square root two is something you cannot reach by the ordinary means. And what you try to do is you try to the mystic, consider as mystical knowledge and you have to use this way to do it. So this one in Bertrand Russell's view is a new religion. And the, for it one sense is new and then he said it's popular in Southern Italy and the Sicily, okay. So basics is uh, the idea is during that time in that area, uh, beginning with so-called the Bacchus. Okay. Bacchus is the, uh, the god of wine and they go party and uh, drinking and uh, uh, orgy, this kind of thing. And then they have the mystical movement like officer. And the Pythagorean is bring up this one. So uh, Bertrand Russell write is the office, unlike the priest of Olympian cult founded what we may call churches. So it's a religious community to which everybody without distinction of race or sex could be admitted by initiation and the form their influence aroused in the concept, conception of philosophy as a way of life. So this one is the beginning of the church and the, this kind of mystical community uh, idea of uh, religion. Okay. So you will see the on the Asia minor side, all the philosophers are more we call the scientists. And then on the Southern Italian side, we call the Eleatic school. They are more on the religious, mystical side. And so that's the difference between two sides. So before we move on to the uh, philosopher of Heraclitus, and then I would like to see how you think about this. And then any question or any uh, uh, Idea, suggestion. So, so far, so good. Okay, so let's move on. Um, last week, we talked about this philosopher. He is a so called Heraclitus. And and really like to read the, uh, his writing on that. And he do have a, he is one of the what we shall call he's the first philosopher we have his writing. Even it's not a complete writing, so we have a fragment. That's why last week uh, 
I show the uh, 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 put the uh, reading as a uh, uh, for the meetup. So the I don't want to repeat what we have last week, but basically, his key idea, key philosophy is uh, sometimes we call the philosopher of riddles. He has a paradox uh, philosophy, and he talk about logos. And then his idea is talking about becoming, and then sometimes we call the doctrine of perpetual flux. And uh, remember, when uh, during that time on the uh, Ionian side, uh, which is uh, 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 Asia Minor, they all talk about Archer. Okay, so the Archer he's talking about is fire. So that's the his philosophy. And I probably want to quickly read. I think last week we. Read this one. I just copy some of them, not all. Uh, so, uh, basics on the very first one is important. We talk about this logos is true every, every more, okay, forever true. So, that's his key thing. And then he talk about the famous thing is that he talk about you cannot step twice into the same river for fresh water are ever flowing on you. Okay, so, that's his famous. Uh, uh, saying about this. And the time is the child playing a game of jobs. Now the jobs is kind of the chess game and the, the kinship is in the hand of a child. And he talk about war and the war is the father of all and the kind of all, uh, the kin of all life is justice. It's a little bit um, controversial, but that's the uh, fragment we left and about the nature, he talked about the fire of is for all things. And then at that time they already had idea of uh, uh, four element. And uh, he already started to talk about the element is changing. Remember his philosophy, because during that time, I think it's in the ancient people, the first thing you try to, they try to explain is what's going on in this world, right? So the world is changing. So they try to find out what's the rule. So Heraclitus is talking about the things changing, becoming. So earth become fire, fire become air, air become water, water become earth. In his world, he means the death of earth comes with fire and the, the death of fire comes with air and the, the death of air comes with fire and the death of uh, water and the death of water comes with earth. So there is one like a, 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 a cycle. So that's his view on that. So he also talked about the soul, okay? So interesting is he believed the soul is like to go to moist, okay? So the, it's a pleasure to soul to become moist, but the dry soul is the white, wise and the best. So this, idea, the philosophy he is talking about is our soul has nature to get wet, okay? But only the smart people, the best people will make his soul dry, okay? So that we can see, well, in today's interpretation, we may see as a modern people, you may see that doesn't make sense, but we have to appreciate he's, he is the person start to, instead of look at the nature, he start to give some moral lesson. Okay. So I think that's advanced in this point of view. And then we can move on. Then he talk about, I don't have highlight on this one. And then, okay, I think this one to me, I think is more important because he start to look at Heraclitus, start to look at this world is, kind of a paradoxical universe, right? So he started to talk about the sea is the purest and impurest water, right? Fish can drink it, but the man cannot drink it, okay? It's destructive. He see everything is not pure good or pure bad. He talk about pig wash in the mat, in the mud and the fowl wash in dust, because mud and dust are dirty, but they clean with this one. And the acids, donkey would rather have a straw than gold. Okay, so he start to look at uh, this universe 
as a paradoxical view. Okay, there's no pure good, pure bad, even in the person. So he also talk about uh, to my logos, compared to all things, everything is one. So basics, that's his uh, philosophies. And then what we have is just, I think total is about 120 fragments left. And a lot of things are uh, interpret or reinterpret by Aristotle and the Plato. So, you know, and last time when uh, I think Dan, Dan was here, he can read Greek and he had some more, more insight about, you know, what the actual meaning of this. So I will pause here for a few, uh, one minute, if you have a question or you have some more uh, text you want to read on this one. So after this, I'm going to move to the uh, 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 ideatic school. No question? Yes. Yes, please. Uh, Ron? Yeah. Okay, please. I just wondered if uh, you ever came across in your readings any explanation or you might have some um, 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 uh, your own feeling about why it seemed that um, on the uh, on one side of, of uh, Greece the, um, to to their east, it was a very materialistic scientific Milesian, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. What we would call very left brain today, very <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. Uh -huh. and, and why the other side is mystical? And the other is what we, yeah we would call very right brain. If it, yeah. You know, so I wonder if it had anything to do with. I, I only know one side, okay, uh, not the other side, okay. So I know uh, some uh, scholar talk about the uh, Malaysian school, which is on the east, right, on the Asian minor side, they are more scientific. Uh, the reason is, uh, in the early time, Malaysia as a city, uh, they are very successful in their trading. So technically, they probably live a very good materialistic life, okay? So they enjoy a lot of life, a uh, good life. So for the people enjoy the good uh, material life, probably less interest in God or use the, they, they believe God or the Greek God, Zeus, Hera, all people, they believe it, but they don't use the mythology to explain what's going on in this world. So I think that that's the reason, or well, it's not my, my idea, I read it on other article. Regarding on the other side, which is on the Southern Italian side, that's why I bring up this one, uh, uh, officer. And I copy from Bertrand Russell, okay? So also not my idea. He's talking about they have the religious movement, okay? And he talked about officer. And officer being considered, according to Bertrand Russell, uh, it's a new religious movement, which originally originated from uh, Egypt, okay? Because they deal with death, okay? Before their religion is more on uh, Bacchus. Bacchus is uh, the god of wine, okay? And then easily being replaced for the new religion, which is officer and which is praise the God of Orpheus, who is the God of music. Because uh, I think uh, uh, Apollo taught him uh, how to play lyre and he become an expert in music. So, so, so that's a new movement. And the, the, because the story is he went to the hell, uh, Hades, and to rescue his wife and turn out he lost his wife, all this kind of story. So it's related to the death and they start to think about things mystical. So that's the only thing I can offer. You know, I hope it satisfy you wrong. Okay, I have, an, I have one other question. Yeah, please. Um, that, that time, roughly the sixth century, fifth century BC mm -hmm. is often referred to as the axial age. 
there was a lot going on in that age. In uh, in India, in India, you had uh, the Buddha arising, and in China, you had Lao Tzu, etc. Yeah. And I was wondering, in in that era, and um, was the is Silk Road in existence? Was it being used in that in that period, or was the Silk Road uh, something that came later? Because I was uh, wondering about no, Silk Road is much later. Silk, much Silk later. Road, yeah, Silk okay. Road is on the uh, first century, okay, after first century until the uh, six centuries they start to uh, reach the India, and okay. then so if uh, uh, if um, if. Uh, Greece got any um, insights from uh, from that part of the world? It probably would have been uh, through the merchants from seagoing uh, merchants and stuff, more likely, right? From sea, I don't know about sea because I don't see the technology probably not mature enough. So, because there were suggestions that Plato might even have in the twelve years when they don't know where he went, he may have. It may have traveled all the way to India. So I was wondering if there... uh, some people talk about he even went to India. Yes. Okay. But um, most likely is uh, if uh, when you read the Plato's uh, philosophy, you will see a lot of similarity. Uh, you will see the definitely the influence by the uh, uh, Pythagorean okay, idea. Okay. So we will talk about later, uh, no, in a few minutes about the. Uh, Parmenides, and for sure he studied with Parmenides, which a lot of mystical thinking. And I, I know a lot of people kind of start to question about whether or not Indian and Greek have a connection. And then I don't know. And then uh, probably there's no solid historical evidence to say, okay, they have a connection. But for sure they have a connection is uh, after, uh, after 300 BC, uh, when Alexander the Great, you know, uh, conquered Northern India, and they have a lot of things for sure. Okay, so for example, the skepticism, uh, uh, pyrorism, okay, they are definitely, they have some related connection with India. But during this time, we don't know. Only thing we know is both Indian and uh, Greek, they have the concept of reincarnation. You are reborn, okay? Your soul will recycle again and again, but do they in, invent it independently? I don't know. Okay, probably just coincidence. I, I don't know. Okay. So I hope I answered the question. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a good answer. It's the, it's the best answer. I don't know. Yeah, we don't know. I, I, any some people may claim they know, but uh, oh, uh, they, I, I'm happy to 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 listen to that. But I just can tell you uh, what I read and uh, what I heard. So, <laughs> okay. So, uh, any other question or anything you want to discuss before I really move on to the Italian side? Because I have a question. Yes, please. It, yeah, it's in the Suga's uh, thing. Yeah, on uh, the previous uh, number 118. It says, don't listen to me, but listen to my. Uh, which one? Oh, I mean the. Uh, the last one. Okay, hold on. Let me see. Okay, this one. Okay, 118, right? Right. Okay, it's wise to hearken, not to me, but to my logos. And to. Right. Okay. Basically, logos is uh, the uh, soul or the uh, knowledge of things, right? Uh, no, uh, logos is a. Uh, I a lot of translation will change to words or reason, right? Well, so, yeah, that's the uh, very obvious one. Yeah, yeah. So, and then if we want to bring like a uh, key lesson of uh, Heraclitus, a logo is probably the number one. He probably the first one to mention about logos, and uh, they, of course, what's the meaning of logos? That's a big question, but. Yeah, you know, he's the first one talking about this. Because that even comes down to Christianity, talking about logos. Yes, if you, uh, yeah, yeah. If you talk about the uh, John one one, right? For the at the beginning, there's a word, and the word is God. Yeah. The word with God. Right. The word basics is from Greek word logos, right? 
Yeah, eight means um, <laughs> a lot of number of, of uh, things. Um, when it says uh, all things are one, yeah, is there some identification of that one is? Is it uh, like, for example, if you talk about God, you would talk about one. Uh, so is that, does that have any connotation or any thing? I, 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 don't, I don't know, okay? But I believe, okay, during that time, they are, look, they are looking, they, we can call them uh, Moise, right? Because they believe on something on the background, the starting point, uh, is, uh, they call it uh, uh, Arche. A, that's a Greek word, A-R-C-H-E, Arche. Okay, so that yeah. means the fundamental stuff, right? That so, means, correct, you're right, it's the beginning. Yeah, the beginning, yeah. So uh, he probably talked about this, because this one we only- Right. Uh, so basically it's, uh, it would be what we call now the universe. Yeah, you can go this way. and. And then the reason I bring this one, and I, I, I thank you to bring up this one, and then you will see uh, this, we talk about one, okay? And when we talk about eidetic school, okay, on the Southern Italian side, their one, so-called one, is very different than what Heraclitus talk about one. Even they all deal with something called one, or oneness. And then because they are on the different side, and they have, different teaching on that. Thank you. So we can say, if I move on to the uh, Ita Southern Italian site, so-called the Idiotic School, so basically the reason called Idia, because this area, okay, if you look at the map, it's on this area. And then uh, their philosophy basics is, we can say they are response to what's happened on the other side, Heraclitus. Okay. So uh, usually if you search for the internet, okay, you probably will get the EDS school for sure, we have these three philosophers, uh, Parmenides and Zeno and uh, Melissus. Uh, but sometimes people include the Xenophanes, okay? And because he, even, he was from the other side, but eventually he settled on here, Syracuse. Okay, so he's kind of, again, same situation happened. He's more on the religious side. He start to believe uh, uh, the God, it should be have one God, okay? And uh, uh, he's talking about the fox or tiger. If tiger has hand to draw their God, and not look like tiger. If they have fox or donkey has hand, they will draw their God like donkey. So he start to think God has is one. So this kind of thing has come up. And then, so we talk about uh, uh, Xenophanes last week. So basically that eventually he was on the other side and he was a scientist kind of person, but later on, same as Pythagoras, he's more on the religious and he moved on here. So just try to answer Ron's question, why, uh, People on this side is more scientific and on this side is more mystical. I still don't know, but whenever they become more mystical, religious, they move to this side. So that's the only thing we find out. So that's the idiotic school and we have these people and we are going through, but basics we are going to talk about Parmenides. And he's the most important, uh, probably has a strong influence um, Socrates, not necessarily Socrates, but most likely uh, uh, Plato's. When we talk about Plato's, they have a 12 years escape or, because Socrates was sentenced to death and uh, uh, Plato know he is in danger. So he went overseas. We don't know whether or not he went to India or whether or not he went to, uh, he probably went to Egypt. And for sure, he went to Southern Italy and uh, he learned. I don't know if he met Parmenides or not, but for sure he get learned a lot of things from Parmenides. So uh, there's one dialogue 
called Parmenides, and uh, Plato set up uh, the scene is Socrates, Parmenides, and the Parmenides student, Zeno, their discussion. So that's the thing. So, so Parmenides' philosophy, okay, I don't know how many of you read this one, but it's, I just have to say, first time I read it, I just have to say it's weird. Okay, it's crazy. How can you call this philosophy? But after a while, I start to appreciate okay, what he invented for this way. So I will say this way. Uh, is somebody talking? Can you mute it? It's well. Okay, I'm going to mute you. I'm going to mute everyone. Okay. So, uh, so Parmenides, okay, so basics, uh, the, the, let me make it very simple. What he is looking for, uh, I think we talk about what, right? He believed in this world, this universe, it's one. And he has, his conclusion is this, okay? You, probably, you I'm sure everyone first time hear this will feel very strange. He talked about this universe, Talk about the truth is only one, which is changeless, okay, motionless. It's a solid, it's a finite, it's ungenerated, it's indestructible, it's a sphere. Okay, so that's the universe. Okay. And then how does he come with this conclusion? He based on three assumptions, which all Greek world, they all believe this three things. First, they all believe. Nothing can come from nothing, or nothing can disappear into nothing. Okay, so something cannot disappear into nothing. Okay, so that's they all believe. He's not going to argue on that. Number two, the Greek all believe the reality. If we talk about truth, they only one. You cannot have this truth and this one is truth. So there's only one reality. So number three, whatever really exists is identical with whatever property is really is. It's a little bit strange, but basically what they believe is uh, in today's world, we will say if this, mm, uh, they don't separate, <clears throat> let's say fire, fire is hot. They don't separate what is fire and uh, what is hot. So when we say the fire is hot, they would consider the hotness and the fire are the same thing. Another example is ice. Ice is cold and the coldness is also part of the ice. So they don't separate the property and the material. So these three things are the Greek or belief. And the Parmenides is based on this universal, so-called universal belief. Based on his logic, he draw the conclusion because based on this assumption, this world must be one, okay? And uh, uh, must be changeless, motionless, because there's no void, okay? If there's no space, how can you change? How can you move? And, and then infinity is not possible. So it must be finite and the indestructible is a sphere. So that's his philosophy. And he is drawing from this. And then how does he come this one? I don't want to go to the too much detail of why we appreciate his philosophy because he is the first person start to use logic. So sometimes we call him the father of logic because he used logic and he believe what's the deduction, okay, from the result from your logical deduction, not what you see. So everybody easily to argue with him, well, come on, everything is moving, my hand can move, this cup can move, I can burn something which is disappear, and the, the baby is nowhere, then you can have a baby, right? And a small, uh, a seed can grow to a, a, a oak tree, Okay, so acorn can become an oak tree. You, you can argue on this, but his point is we have to believe the logic, not what you see. What you see just, you say, phenomenal. Okay, so uh, the 
the image. So, yeah. so uh, that's the, uh, we can do some of his reading. So uh, I think I post the reading. If you have read it, I post, I, I just copy the entire text he has uh, in this presentation, but I don't have intention to read all of them. I just want to uh, show uh, how does he write the philosophy. His writing, including, of course, that's a fragment and uh, the people, some scholars try to piece them together and they come with a kind of a writing and which is not very long. So uh, if you have time, I will suggest, suggest you take a look and you can read it. And I think it's very readable and just a little bit weird. And if you know the overall structure, you may not be that difficult to understand. So his writing has three parts, uh, so-called on nature. First is prologue. He's talking about he is, well, he's been bring up to some place and went to the gate of the way of night and day. And they have the goddess, okay, greet me, which is a, uh, a permanent is, and then, uh, Okay, I greet him and took his hand and then speak to him. Okay, so the following is the speaking from the goddess tell community. Okay, so that's the way of he do it. Basically, he's talking, talking about, okay, you should restrain thy thought from this way of increase and don't let habit by your experience. So the key word is here, the goddess teach taught permanent you have used new way of thinking. You should give up your habit learning by experience. If you recall what's happened on the Asia Minor, uh, 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 a Malaysian philosopher, they all based on their experience to explain this. So here it's talking about you have to rely on logic. Then we come with two parts. First part is the way of truth. Okay, and the other part is the way of belief. So he's the first person to separate, okay, what is truth and what just you believe. And the, what he's talking about, a sphere, changeless, uh, motionless, okay, uh, he's talking about the truth. So he talk about the truth. So basically he separates the first, the, the, what that it is and the, it is not. Okay, so you have to believe what it is. And then he started talking about the truth, what is uncreated and indestructible. It's a complete, immovable, without end. That's what he's talking about. So he talked about the truth is no, div uh, no divisible and since all alike. And uh, there is no more of it in one place than in another to hinder from holding together. So based talk about the truth, the sphere is indivisible. So that's uh, the way he talked about the truth and that it has limit, it's complete on all sides, like the mass around its sphere equally posed uh, from the center to all direction. So that's the God is told permanent about the truth. That's the truth, okay? And then he then continue on the third part. He talked about the way of belief. So that's the motto, okay? The regular people understand the world. So previously the way of truth is understood by immortal, which is God, okay? Which is truth. And the, uh, uh, the way of belief is understood by mortal, the regular people. So he talked about henceforward then the belief of mortals and give ear to deceptive order of my world. So basically he's talking about the she, she, she's talking about the real world. What you see is not real. So you see something disappear, uh, the baby was born, the acorn tree, acorn globe become a big oak tree. That's all not real, okay? The real, the truth is that, okay? So, uh, so here, that's uh, let me read that. She is the beginner of all painful births of beginning, driving the female to embrace the male, the male to that of female. So the conclusion, that's what. 
uh, thus, according to men's opinion, these things come into being. Thus, they are not. In time, they will grow up and pass away. To each of these things, men have assigned a fixed name. So that's his writing. And something is a little bit, I will say, mystical. He writes, on the right boys, on the left girl. I, I, I really don't know what they mean, but basics, you know, that he's writing, always looking the pin of the song. I think here he talking about, oh, I think he talking about this. I read some scholar explain this. He's talking about the, uh, he's talking about what we see is just like a moon. Moon is borrow the light from the sun, okay? They already know this. So it's not real truth, okay? So the real truth is the sun, the light. So if you remember of if you know uh, Plato's uh, uh, the, 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 the allegory of cave, right? He's talking about everyone is in the cave. The only truth is happen when you leave the cave, going outside, okay? Then that's the truth. And that's why that this philosophy is important because Plato's epistemology is borrowed from Parmenides. So that's the Parmenides side. And then I will stop for one minute if you have a question or something you want to further discuss, you know, or you have any suggestion. Uh, Ron, please. Yeah. Um, so again, this um, these two different um, areas. Uh, again, the um, the uh, Malaysian side, the east east, seems to be the sort of the um, the, uh, the ground from which uh, empiricism empiricism yeah would arise, right? You know, and and eventually, I think you know it would be. The the the, um, the the what what Aristotle was drawn to. Uh, I I I I well let, let me just I, I, I have to say let yes. Me, let me just you know set, set the whole scene and then you can take it apart. Okay, please. So, yeah. So uh, the other side on the west is more what we would call maybe idealism, mm -hmm. using ideas, the mind, reason. Um, and I think that I would say that, you know, that Plato was more sympathetic um, to that, that uh, way of, of um, uh, looking at the creation. Um, what, what do you think of that? I mean, it's all obviously oversimplified. And obviously, Athens is kind of like in the middle, right, in, in Greece proper. So it's kind of, you know, and like you said, you know, when the, the empiricists become mystical, they, they move. <laughs> they migrate. They, they migrate. Uh, you know, west. <laughs> yeah, I don't know because they migrate, so they become mystical. Or they they were mystical. Yeah, they I think mystical out. first, and then they migrate. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably they got mystical. They got kicked out from their neighbor. From their. Uh, yeah. Country. Anyway, what, what I mean, you know, it's a, but it, you know, it's sort of also you could see those are the two main strands that all of Western philosophy is going to grow, grow out of those two basically different uh, ways of seeing the creation, just like the left and the right hemispheres of our brain have two different ways of seeing the creation. It's very interesting. Yeah, I also find it very interesting. And uh, Diane, I agree with you 100% because it, of course it's oversimplified, but we can talk about this way, right? Because on the east side is uh, 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 empiricism, and on the west side is idealism. And actually, Socrates, I believe, was influenced more on the east side. And then uh, later on, Plato will be more on the west side because he learned. And you will see in Plato's yeah, yeah, early yeah. Uh, well, Plato's Socrates may not be real Socrates. You know, early early Plato is more empirical and and, and and more sympathetic. And as he matures, you thinking process might 
to, to the West and he becomes more and more mystical. Yes, yes. In the later, the later uh, Plato dialogues are much more uh, mystical. Yes, I agree. And then we have to wait uh, a real scientist, Aristotle, to bring the idea back the more solid. Yeah, like a pendulum, like a pendulum. Yeah. Yeah, so I think, so, I think uh, uh, we probably think about it in the same way. And then I think so this part is very interesting because uh, we know all our Western philosophy, we can trace the source to uh, uh, Greek, okay? But their source is from these two sides, one on the uh, east side, one on the west side. And, the, and, and which they, these two ideas are, uh, a struggle to each other and until to the 18th century, you know, the yeah. British side and the continental philosophy, they all have- I'm just curious in, in, in you know, in your academic studies, um, I, I'd be curious in, in, because uh, North Africa and Egypt, you know, they were, they were, uh, they were organized before Greek, the Greeks, you know, the, the Hebrews and, and the Egyptians. And, and they had what were called the mystery schools. They were already looking at all of these issues before the Greeks started looking at them. And since nothing comes out of a void, um, I wonder how much, you know, we know very little about um, the Egyptians, but they, they must have, uh, the Greeks must have been influenced by uh, uh, the Egyptians. Have you made connections there at all? I, I, I think so. I mean, it builds uh, in uh, uh, Plato's writing, they constantly talk about Egypt. So I'm sure they, they, they know Egypt. And that, that's why Bertrand Russell writes, uh, he believes officer is from Egypt. Mm. And he draw the conclusion because of from Egyptian religion, okay? Uh, so that, that's what he said. And one surprising thing is all these Greek philosophers, nobody mentioned about Jewish community. So it's, this part is a little bit mystical. You know, I don't know. And personally, I don't know much about other than the Old Testament Bible. I don't know much about the uh, Jewish history. So uh, that's the part that like, the link is not there because they're supposed to be in the same time. And then there's no record about the Jewish community and their uh, belief. So that's uh, Hannah, please. Um, so I was just thinking about his way of truth. And um, if he's kind of isolating the concept of truth, it seems to kind of entail that there's the concept of you know untruth, not truth, Maybe that's the way of belief as well. Um, but if those things are pretty opposite, um, how does that fit into his idea of monism or like the one, the whole, that everything is unchanging and part of one thing? If um, how, how would we get from truth or non-truth to truth without an idea of change? Or how do we how, hold those concepts together if they seem to be like a duality. Okay, so I think you the to answer this one, probably we have to go to the later philosophy. I think we will cover in a few minutes. Okay, because I think for sure, you know, permanent is okay. First, I'd like to say <clears throat> uh, he talked about the way of truth, but the other way is not untruth. He's talking about way of belief. So he's talking about something. If I see this cup. Okay, that's not really the truth. That's just what you believe this is cup. And they have the truth behind it. That's what he's talking about. So, uh, but based on his logic, he draw the conclusion, everybody knows. We, we, we don't need the modern people to know that's real. I think during that time, the Greek people already see that's, that's crazy. So his later philosopher tried to resolve this problem. Because just like what you questioned, uh, how, yeah, we know there's only one truth. I'm not going to argue on it, but it's not one, right? It could be two, could be three, could be four. And, and how does this come out? You cannot just say, oh, that's just, you believe and the truth. How does, how do you from belief to the truth? They got to have a way to do it. So later philosophy try to, resolve this problem. And that's what I'm going to do for the next 
20 minutes. But before I move on, I would like to introduce uh, uh, his student, and he's a famous uh, the Zeno. Okay, so if you read the, uh, they, you know, he Zeno is a community student. Okay, and the way I talk about he's famous because Zeno's uh, paradox okay, is very famous, and uh, it's been used not only in the Greek time through the year. Okay, even like uh, Anna Burson uh, and Bertrand Russell. Uh, I think Leibniz also talked about this and the, not today's philosopher, but you know, even in the 20th century philosopher still talk about Zeno's paradox. Okay, so uh, I think probably some of you already heard this one, but you know, uh, I just like to, to do, he talked about many paradoxes, okay, paradoxes, but I just, this four, because this four has been constantly discussed over the, over 200, 2000 years. And then we don't have Zeno's writing on this. And the source, I think the first source is from Aristotle's physics. So I copy from Aristotle's physics. I sort of talk about this. So. Remember, Zeno is the student of uh, Parmenides. Remember, Parmenides philosophy is talking about nothing change, everything is one, change is not possible. So Zeno, he has four, actually it's more, more than four, but I just this four because these four are famous. Uh, this this four to prove, to show you uh, motion is not possible. So the first one, Okay, uh, we can talk about is so called Atlanta. Atlanta is a goddess who is a foot racer. So he said Atlanta cannot reach the goal, okay? Because when he wants to run, she wants to run from here to here, right? She runs the health and the run health and the run health and run health and run health. He will never reach it. So Zeno used to run to say, Moving is not possible, whatever you see moving. Actually, you see, you cannot even uh, Atlanta, Atlanta cannot reach the goal. Second one, also famous about Achilles race is turtle, turtles, right? Uh, the turtle was here, Achilles tried to catch the turtle, the turtles. She ran here and during this time, the turtles are removed and Achilles, Achilles move a little bit and turtle move a little bit. And if he move, he moves. So, you know, <clears throat> he get closer and closer, but he never had the chance to catch the turtles, right? Because he, he, right now he's talking about uh, the time, the division of time, right? So you never have a chance to catch the turtle. And then then also talk about the flying arrows. <clears throat> so he talk about the arrow, when you shoot arrow, you will reach the target. But you take the moment by moment. Because during that time, remember, the Greek doesn't have no have no concept of instant velo velocity, instant speed. We know we have a speed, the instance at that moment, what's the speed? But that's not developed until Newton. That's like 2000 years later. So during that time, they consider everything move as a change of state. So in this concept, he said, okay, in this state, arrow is here, not moving. Here is not moving, not moving. So actually the arrow itself is never moved. So that's his argument. Number four, he talked about moving rows. Okay, so basically he's talking about that. This one is a little bit difficult, okay? But uh, I find out that that's probably the best way to understand. Uh, let's say we have three rows. A1, A2, A3, B1, B2, B3, C1, C2, C3, they die up in this way, okay? So this row is going to move to, you, to the right, this row will move to the left, okay? So every, let's say every second, it move one space this way. So before they die up in this one, A2 is A, B3 is C1, okay? So that's the die up. Right? So next second, because this one will move to here, right? 
So B3 will move by up with A3. And then, um, and then C1 will move the way to, uh, C1 will move the way to here, will line up with, uh, okay, will line up with uh, A1, right? So that's the way they are doing. And then, uh, so the question is here, if the one second, A1, B1, C1 line up, A3, B3, uh, C3 line up, but how come they miss the point, right? Because before C1 line up, with B1, they have the period time C1 die up with B2. They just skip this part. So that's the uh, the, the 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 paradoxic. Okay, uh, Zeno is talking about. So uh, I know it probably it's easy to re reject this argument, but you have to reject in the modern concept, right? Like instant speed, like uh, infinitesimal, okay. In, uh, that's the, 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 the infinite, infinitesimal, okay, space to explain. But how can you reject without this modern concept? That's the challenge here. So uh, that's why this four uh, paradoxes has been used over and over for uh, 2000 years. And even, I'm not sure today, but Bertrand Russell is the last one. He wrote it in 19th, 20th century. And he still, when he talk about the logic, he still use this one as an example. So it sounds like every philosopher, when you want to talk about the movement, you have to reject this one in your own way. So uh, I hope it make it clear and uh, anything to uh, question or any comment before I move on. So right now we're done with the uh, Parmenides philosophy. Okay, so next one we're going to, of course, just like Hannah talked about, uh, I think everyone will have conclusion. Okay, Parmenides philosophy is strange. Okay, how can it happen in this way? So, Melissa is the first one trying to improve. So basically, he talked about. He replaced, he said, it should have, he bring the concept of unlimited infinity. So he basically modified uh, Parmenides philosophy instead of the limited side sphere, he just said it should be infinity because that's an obvious question, right? If you talk about uh, a fit, finite size of the sphere, then easy to ask question, how about outside the sphere, what's there? Since there's no void, then they got to have something. So the easy solution by Melissa is, is infinite. Okay, that's his solution out there. And so that's the first solution. And then later on, okay, so this philosopher, okay, uh, in Pedicles, okay, from uh, Akiragas, okay, also on, uh, Akiragas is on the uh, CCD. Okay, on the west side of CCD. So belong to the same school. And then uh, he tried to uh, resolve Parmenides' uh, philosophy. He become more uh, sophisticated. So basically he's talking about four elements. Okay? So he talked about instead of uh, one, it's, it's just like, we need to explain, you know, you cannot just say, oh, that's just what you see. That's just the uh, 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 phenomenon you see and the real is there, but how they have the connection. So he started to use four elements to connect. And just like we all understand on the West side in the Southern Italian, they are more go to the mystical religious side. So they are four elements is linked with uh, uh, God. So air with uh, Zeus, earth with Hera, his wife, and the fire with Hades, and water with uh, Persephone. So Persephone is the wife of uh, Hades. <coughs> and then you can see how they deal with this one because 
they are superstitious. They even don't want to, when he's writing, he even doesn't want to talk about Haiti because it's, it, it's a taboo to call Haiti and the Pacifonis name because they are in the hell. So they call him Iotonius and Nestis. Okay, so uh, that's their idea. And they talk about, so they even go more, okay? So they talk about original sin already because the sin, because you eat meat. Okay. So uh, Empedocles also had the writing that uh, in his uh, fragment. So I also show some of this, so you can, uh, we can read this one together. Talk about the nature, we talk about fire and the water and the earth and the minor. So, okay. So we can think about that. He talked about four elements before, Parmenides, okay, talk about one, one is indivisible. But right now, if he replays to four, then he try to explain how come it changed. So you must have the some force to make it change. So he bring up the two things. One is love, one is strife. So love is like attraction, okay, and strife is like push away. So he described in this universe, everything is the combination of the four elements, fire, water, earth, and air. And they have the two forces. One is love, one is strife. So we'll bring them together or split them together. So that's his idea of way to explain, okay? Why there's one truth and why we see things is changing. So he talked about they have the six elements, Right, four elements plus two forces. That's what he's talking about. And then his view of the universe, his cyclical view on the cosmos, the cosmos right? He talked about the, at the beginning, okay, there's a pure love. So in this universe, it's harmony. So there's no light because everything is harmony. It's a beautiful, perfect situation, okay, just like in heaven. There's no light, just there. Then the love increase. So they become the uh, contention between love and the strife. And during that time, they have the presence of uh, life. And the later on, the strife going over, take over the love. So become everything just strife. So that's like he called chaos. I believe that means void and also means chaos. So there's no life. So that's emptiness. And then when the strife get more and life grow, there's another contention between strife and love. That's the place we have uh, uh, a life. So he believes that's the cycle okay, in this world. So in the old time, they have the pure love. That's all good thing. Okay? And then uh, they found that's the cycle. So that's his cosmic, uh, cosmic cycle and his view. And then you will see even up to Plato and even to the Plato, they all try to explain okay, Parmenides' uh, philosophy. So that's it. And I just show some of the writing. He talked about something interesting. He talked about sea is the sweet of the earth. Okay? So that's his view. And then uh, he even take one more step. Okay, He start to consider himself, I mean, the. Uh, in Pedicles, himself is an immortal God, reincarnate as a people. So he talked about that's his writing. He said, I go among you an immortal God. He thinks he is immortal God. And that they go after me in countless throne, ask me what is the way to gain and some desiring oracle, and beg me to hear. From, uh, uh, back to hear from me the word of hearing. He talk about the people get sick and he can cure. And he start talking about the oracle of uh, necessities. And he talk about he, he talk about the God, okay? Or wonder twice, uh, 10,000 season, which has been borrowed by Plato, okay? And the uh, soul will travel okay, 10,000 years, and they will have a three times reincarnate. That's what he's talking about. And throughout the time, and he talk about 
for the mighty, the air will drive him to the sea, and the sea will change to the dry earth and to the sun, and back to the cycle. And he says, "What of this? I now I am." Okay, so he talk about himself, himself, in Pentecost, himself is an exile and the wandering from the God. Okay, and for that I put my trust in the in such a strike. So he turned out he's not only philosopher, he also a religious leader, and he believed he is a God. Okay, he's one of the God. And according to the legend, he eventually eventually he jumped over to the uh, volcano of uh, Ida, okay, and only that ascended, so uh, he died. Okay, so that's his story, and also his philosophy. Philosophy. So I will stop for a second before I move to Anaxagoras. So. Question, comment? Yeah, you just had one slide on the uh, philosopher before um, Empedocles. I forgot his name, but could you go back to that one slide? I think it was only one slide on. Um, you mean before the? After Parmenides and before Empedocles. After uh, this one, yeah. Melissa. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, you didn't, you know, maybe they don't have much, you know. Uh, no, I don't have much information. Yeah, about him, but, but, but um, what, he's, what he's saying here is very profound in these three statements. Yes, yes, yes. Um, he's saying whatever has a beginning and an end is basically not real. Um, uh, be, and then he says being, has no beginning or end. Therefore, it is eternal and unlimited. I don't know if any other philosophies before him or even if they picked on it right away, but he seems to be uh, introducing uh, these concepts of eternal and unlimited. Yeah, that, that's right. But that's, very big. that's a big deal. Uh, I agree with you. That's a big deal. But uh, but uh, Aristotle rejected, right? Aristotle very sure there's no. Of course, of <laughs> course, uh, because of his left hemisphere, he wants everything to fit into a compartment. But yes. the mystics, the mystics have no problem with these kind of paradoxes. Oh, that's right. You are right. Yeah, because they are mystics. But, so but this no is, uh, you know, this would be, you know, you know, you could easily, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, sort of then uh, then I you could overlap this over the Tao, for example. Uh yes, uh, yes, that's right. And, okay. and, and, you know, in in Hinduism, you can uh, you know the same thing could be said of, of the you know the Brahman. Um, but um, I think that um, I think Plato in he's he's going after this this thread here. Plato is much more heading, you know, in this direction, whereas Aristotle is kind of going away from this direction. I, I agree with you. I agree with you, yes. And, and you make a good point. Hinduism and the Chinese, they don't have a problem of uh, eternal and unlimited, right? Right. Yeah, only the, the I think the Malaysian, Ionian school, they probably have a problem. <laughs> very, very, because um, just like um, humans uh, who are left brain predominant versus right brain, and because they see the world so differently, they, they very rarely can come to agreement on a lot of fundamental issues. And I think it's the same thing here, you know, um, depending on what apparatus the human being is using to understand. Uh, what the creation they 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 create different uh, narratives, different pictures of of the world, and uh, they're not they're not really compatible. Yeah, mm -hmm. great. But Thank but you. Then, you know, I, I was reading the Buddhism. They have this thing called the doctrine of the two truths. Yes, that's about Nak uh, Nakajira. Yeah, and that's like the the one truth is the conventional truth, and that's. Uh, what the empiricists, you know, the world as it is, it's practical and so forth, right? 
And then there's the other truth, which yeah, is the real truth. truth. And I think that was what, um, when Parmenides goes to that, uh, that woman, a goddess, she's telling him, she's talking about that same thing, about two, two truths. Great, thank you. That's a good point. And actually, I just did a presentation on the last Saturday on the Buddhism. I, I didn't think about Parmenides. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I talk about the uh, Nagajira's uh, two, two truths, the convenient, uh, convenient truth and the ultimate truth, and they take the middle way, you know, middle path on that. Right, right. Yeah, sort of, sort of a, a synthesis, a Hegelian synthesis. Yes, yeah, but uh, I didn't think about, thank you for reminding me, I didn't think about you know, I also use two brands, but you know, one West, one East. And the, at the time <laughs> I was too much in the Buddhism thinking, not thinking about Parmenides. So <laughs> yeah, thank you. So for the last two slides, I think I will do for the last two slides and we can conclude the pre-Socratic. So thank you everyone. And the, we have a smaller group, but turn out I think we got doing very well. At least I feel great on this. So. Basis and Exagoras, he's on the other side. Remember, he's not on the Southern Italian side. So after Parmenides, everybody tried to respond. Okay, why? Just like uh, Hannah's question, right? They have the truth and we see something different. How does these two things connect? So you will see the uh, Empedocles talking about four elements talking about the two forces, the love and the strife. And Exagoras on the other side, and according to some legend, he was the teacher of Socrates. Okay. So we, we don't know whether or not there's no solid evidence, but most scholars probably believe uh, he was 30 years older than uh, Socrates, and the, he faced the same situation as Socrates. He has been in charge of impiety because he really, well, I should say he probably is an atheist. He didn't talk about God at all. Uh, he's a pure scientist, but he also had to respond what uh, Parmenides is talking about, right? So basically he is talking about the, uh, everything exists in everything, okay? So let me, so his famous argument is snow is black because snow includes everything, including some blackness there. So snow is black. And you can see the evidence when the snow melts, you will see some water, sometimes it's black. So because all these people, they have to explain things is why things change, right? Since permanence sounds right, the logic, based on logic, they have the one truth, something not change. But you still have to explain what's going on in this world. You cannot just say, oh, that's the mortal belief. And then you got to need some step to explain. So Anaxagoras is on the other side, Asia Minor, and he traveled to Greek. So sometimes we consider he's the first uh, uh, travel to Athens. So he probably the first philosopher in Athens, and he taught Socrates and the Socrates is supposed to be second philosophy in essence. So he talked about uh, coming in, he talked about the Greeks are wrong, right? Because they keep arguing something go to you know, being or becoming, right? When you talk about becoming, he talked about Heraclitus. When you talk about being, you talk about permanence. So he talked about things that should be coming into existence, mixture, and the passing away separation. So that's what he's talking about. And then remember in, in Pedicles, four elements, then we have to deal with the force, right? Love and the strife. And here he deal with thing he call noose. Okay, so we can call might in today's uh, language in Greece called noose. So basically noose is the force to bring them together or separate them to make the change. So of course it will be a little bit weird to talk about the news is kind of material. So he talking about, so basics, not only people has mind, <coughs> everything has mind. So like uh, acorn will grow to the uh, oak tree, they have mind to grow 
So in a way you can say he is teleologist, okay? So everything has a purpose which is in mind, okay? So that's the thing he is talking about and then they all try to uh, explain uh, what's going on and then uh, what's happened, uh, what's, how to explain, uh, connect the uh, so-called way of belief and the way of truth. So that's all this, this thing. And the data will come with uh, the uh, Athenian philosopher, uh, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. And we introduced it uh, two months ago. And so next week, we are going to go back to Greece, but we are not going to talk about Plato, Aristotle, or Socrates. We're going to talk about the other school, which is atomist, okay? Uh, so we will deal with atomist and uh, uh, democratics and uh, Epicurus. Okay, so during the same time, because personally I believe uh, during that time in the Greek war, in the essence, they are not one hundred percent idealist like Plato. There's a strong belief of materialist like atomist, but they don't have a lot of uh, writing left, so we probably ignore it. So next week we will talk about the Epicurus and uh, uh, Democritus. So we will then next week we will finish the Greek world and then we can move to the Roman world. So I will stop here and then for uh, a few minutes, 10 minutes discussion if you question and we are willing to uh, share your thought and your idea. So thank you everyone. So any question, any uh, comment and then you know, I have a question, Jason. I, I wonder if you thought about um it seems that um um Heraclitus felt that basically everything is in change, everything is in flux. The, the world is dynamic, constantly, you know, in change. And uh, Parmenides felt as if there was nothing changes. It's one solid block, right? Yeah. <laughs> two, two very, you know, um, different ways. I mean, um, and um, I also think, um, you know, um, as, as, it, as the century, you know, as the centuries rolled on in the West and, and, you know, parallel things are happening in the East, which of these two um, ways of looking at the world is, is, a, is a dynamic, you know, changing flux or is a, a sort of a, a static um, lump of, you know, I just, you know, it, it, it just brings up so many questions. Yes, that's an interesting question. And that's the, I probably very interested on that. And uh, as some of you know, I also host the uh, uh, Asian philosophy on Saturday. And then uh, that's a concerning subject. Like I believe, I, I have to say, if I have to just oversimplify it, I will say, I don't know Hinduism, okay, but I know Buddhism. Buddhism, if we go to the Mahayana school, uh, uh, basics, they were talking about the, uh, the middle way, okay, and not on the change, not the convenient truth and ultimate truth. And then uh, I probably will stay in between. And then uh, Chinese probably will see more on the organic side. Probably will believe the, the Chinese view of uh, universe is very different. Chinese view will be, see more uh, universe is not like you, you see in the uh, in all these philosophers okay in the Greek they all see things. Don't matter you are Heraclitian or Panathenian, you all see things as inorganic. Okay, that's outside me, right? But Chinese will think that I'm part of this universe. So that's a very different. 
Yeah, and it's difficult to explain just in one, a few minutes. Okay, so I hope uh, I provide something useful for everyone and they uh, uh, send information to me if you have a question, comment, suggestion. And thank you, Ron, as a lot of very meaningful question. And they, I also learned a lot from your comment and from your question. Yeah, thank you again. All right, so have a good evening and hope you join next week uh, for we will uh, complete the Greek philosophy and I'm going to introduce the Athens, which is very different from uh, Plato uh, and uh, Socrates and Aristotle. Thank you. See you next week. Thank you so much, Jason. Thank you. Thank you.